Um, Go for it. I just briefly touched that fish sauce and it's pungent now. <laughs> I can smell it on my fingers already. <laughs> What have we got before us, Tom? So, as you are an ancient Roman, yeah, the welcome thing you usually have is um, some nuts, some dried fruits, and you start you start your meal with something like that. So we have uh, dates, uh, hazelnuts, walnuts, and dried figs. And um, we have a salad. It's cucumber salad, but marinated with um, uh, sweet wine, red wine vinegar, mint, and fish sauce. Yum, yum. And a bit of olive oil. So that's kind of, um, yeah, one of the dishes from Apicius, again. The funny thing about this is it looks a little bit like smashed cucumber with soy sauce. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, think, I think all of the dishes will, will bring you to that, you'll, a bit of Asia. Actually, the cucumber is um, homegrown and it's, uh, it's been um, pickled. So I've pickled it Amazing. and now I'm marinating on this dressing. Wow, you're a generous host, Tom. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, I'm getting the fish sauce there. That's intense. But it mixes well with all the rest of the ingredients here. Mm. So, and then here we have um, yellow split uh, peas. Mm -hmm. It looks like hummus. And it looks like hummus. So yeah, they're boiled with onion and carrot and olive oil and vinegar. And you have like a type of porridge, let's say, fava. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's called fava in Greek. And uh, what's happening, so in modern Greece, you, you find it a lot. It's called fava. Mm -hmm. So yellow split pea puree. And uh, yeah, it was popular in the ancient world as well. You would have chickpeas, you would have lentils, and yellow split peas mm -hmm. was the main pulses in the ancient uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. All of the beans, all the bean stuff, it's from Americas. So you wouldn't have any beans. Mm -hmm. But you have peas, yellow split peas, lentils, and chickpeas. Am I right in thinking that the... It was only really the elites that are eating the kind of food that we're making now, like their burgers and the meat and stuff. But the majority of the population were living off things like pulses. Yeah, most, and... most of the time, yes, and bread and porridges. But um, there was, yeah, there was definitely a bigger population that um, it was considered middle class, let's say. There was lots of merchants and there was lots of uh, retired soldiers that they made some money and you have, because you had an empire which was very expansive, you have, you have a lot of... Uh, Diversity and difference yeah, and yeah. unevenness, yeah. Yeah. And when we're talking about Roman, ancient Rome, when we're talking about the Romans in Britain, all of these things are completely, would have been completely foreign prior to the occupation, to the, well, to Britain, so... Occupation, yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, well we can use that word, or yeah. which word would you rather use? I would, I would yeah, I think uh, that's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not like the Celts really wanted the Romans there, did they? No, no. I mean, there was, there was I got the impression that there was, a, there was a small number of people in the south of England who, even prior to the Romans coming and invading Britain, were kind of welcoming of them. And there, there was like trade happening already and there was some wine drinking going on. There was a little bit of commodity exchange. Yeah, of course, of and course. So there was a small number of tribes, people, chiefs and so on, who would have welcomed the Romans and were quite ready to integrate. But by and large, people, they, the Romans had to fight tooth and nail. It took them like four years to get to London. Yeah, Well, yeah, London some, wasn't, yeah, didn't yeah, London yeah, exist, yeah. but to get to the Thames. Thames, yes, exactly. Yeah. Hello, welcome back to The Delicious Legacy an archaeogastronomical adventure through space and time. I'm your host, Thomas Dinas, and on this episode, I have a very special guest with me. So I invited Louis Bassett, the creator, producer, and presenter of the Full English podcast, one of my favorite food podcasts uh, out there, for a little discussion. What have the Romans ever done for us? The internal question Apart from the roads, aqueducts, trade and so on, they also left their mark into the edible history of this country as well. Together with Luis, we, we got into some um, very interesting um, diversions in our long um, discussion trying to find the beginnings of Roman food in Britain and what's left from it. And it's very interesting to see that we discuss spices and the blandness in food and the Christian morals and ethics 
and how all this stuff might be a legacy of Rome. I invited uh, Louis over uh, my house and together we cooked um, an ancient Roman meal inspired partly by Apicius and partly by findings uh, in archaeological sites throughout Britain. It was a super interesting conversation that lasted uh, about three hours together with the cooking, of course, and the eating. And um, we explored the many aspects of Rome's influence in uh, the society in ancient Britain, but also how that legacy is translated and transferred to more modern times. What did the Victorians, for example, thought about Rome and the influence of Rome in Britain and the empire as such? And simultaneously, we tried to delve into the life of everyday Britons back um, 2,000 years ago. And if those events that um, the um, Romans thought as uh, life uh, changing and important were in any way influential to everyday people's lives back then. And so, without further delay, let's get into our episode. Enjoy! Let's set the scene. So let's... Uh, Louis, welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> welcome to the Delicious Legacy kitchen. Thank you so much for having me around. And um, yeah, let's um, talk about uh, Roman British food, whatever the Romans done for us. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a lot, we're going to find out. Yeah, I mean, we already know that. Everyone yeah. always thinks of roads, right? But we're doing food. Yeah, road, roads are not important. They, no. I mean... <laughs> it's just like, you know, why, why do you go on the road to get something to eat, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> why did the chicken cross the road? The Roman road. Why, why did the Roman, Romans build the road? To go... Well, for conquest. Well, for conquest, yeah. Why so, were they doing conquest? Well, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah. There was nothing else to conquer. We're jumping, we're jumping ahead. We're yeah. jumping ahead. But oh, no, yeah. thank you so much for having me. And we've been wanting to do this episode for such a long time now. Because mm. I love your show, Delicious Legacy. And you like mine, I understand. I love yours. Yeah, give me yeah. a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so fish sauce, it was like the tomato ketchup of the ancient Roman world, right? It was a little bit like that. I mean, but maybe even more ubiquitous. It's almost like salt. Like you'd use it in the yeah, you use it for, for seasoning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Instead of salt. Yeah, the full English is one of my favorite food podcasts out there. Yeah, delicious and legacy. Likewise, you go really deep. I like your um, your medieval stuff was really good. Mm, thanks. Yeah, but we, yeah, because yours is about England and about Britain, um, we'll um, go back into the British history mm. and find out. <laughs> Pretty far back, hey. Yeah, two thousand yeah. years, roughly. Roughly two thousand. Yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> yeah. What are the dates? Let's let's start with that. What are the dates in which the Romans were occupying? We are going to use that word, Britain. So I think was it? It's like the six sixty three BC. Is that right? I should know this. So Julius Caesar did an attempt in fifty five BC, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, and um, that was unsuccessful. He wasn't necessarily trying to occupy. He was mm. kind of just proving a point that he was a legend. <laughs> back in Rome <laughs> yeah. uh, he went over he came over to Britain and and because I think people had this sense of um, Britain as this completely far completely foreign place obviously yeah. not part of the Mediterranean and beyond the landmass that is Europe exactly you know, concepts of Europe uh, it was an unknown land yeah. it, was, it was a mythical land Okay, I've got, I found the date. So Julius Caesar came, yeah, 54 and 55 BC and then the Romans under Claudius came 43 43 AD. AD yeah and then people say that they left 410 49 4, 410 yeah it's, it's a, the dates that the last roman legions left to fight wars in europe right yeah good almost 400 years of uh, of roman presence occupation whatever the word we're using in britain so we're going to discuss what they brought with them in terms of food and also what the le- lasting legacies are i guess yeah yeah, exactly. A lot a lot of stuff to cover. You know what I really like about this setup is that my microphone is resting on a copy of Game of Thrones. <laughs> and it's really hard not to think about things like Hadrian's Wall and like conquest and like yeah. you know <laughs> warring tribes without thinking of Game of Thrones. So. It was deliberate, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to tell me the other ingredients in the in this dish? Yeah. Coriander, fresh coriander. Mm-hmm. They, they love coriander. They loved it. They loved it. Okay, so coriander, obviously. 
coriander, pine nuts, pine nuts, fissos. Obviously, obviously, you need fissos and everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, even your dessert. Even the dessert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, originally, I think it was uh, bay tree berries. Oh, really? Bay wow. berries, but you know what the Romans used to call the British? Barbarians. Sort of, yeah. We uh, from a tablet we found at uh, Vidolada in Hadrian's Wall. They used to call them uh, Britonculi, which means wretched little Britons. Nice. <laughs> nice. So I guess they didn't have a good uh, opinion about them. What did they think about the British people, just in general, that we were all like completely backward? Backwards, yeah. They didn't know about food, about civilization, yeah. Yeah. But disclosure, I don't like the Romans, so I think I'm with the, <laughs> with the side of the, <laughs> with the Celts. Yeah, so maybe we should start with kind of some rough idea of what was going on in Britain before the Romans came, it's, mm. it's maybe in terms of their food and just in general. Yeah. Do you, are you able to we paint have some, some sort yeah. of picture? Yeah, we have some rough idea. I mean, uh, there were lots of different tribes mm -hmm. living across Britain. They were generally pastoralists. Um, of course, they were a bit hunters and gatherers, and also they grew some um, millet and some uh, oats and some barley, mm. which is more suitable to the northern climes than wheat. So they had a bit of that stuff happening, but uh, they were, I guess, more in tune with the environment. Their houses were wooden, they were in the edges of forests, they had animals in the forest, they were hunting, they were gathering oysters and seafood from the shores and from the rivers, and generally cooked um, in um, cauldrons, or big stews, or, or they, on wood fire, they had animals like wild boar mm -hmm. and uh, beef. They had more beef in this country than in uh, Europe, I would say, like in Rome. And sheep. And, and a bit of sheep, yeah, mutton. And of course, yeah, pig was generally uh, a good thing as well. Mm. So yeah, a lot of meat, milk, some bread from barley mainly. And um, yeah, fresh cheese, like um, like cottage cheese type of stuff. Mm. Yeah, there was not much of in terms of um, vegetables in the in in Britain. Yeah, it was it was wild vegetables, the wild equivalent of of, uh, of the European ones. There was a lot of that. So yeah, I guess there will be a lot of foraging happening. And to be clear, Britain at this stage, we're just talking about a landmass, like yeah. a group of islands. There's obviously no real central authority in the country. There's no state to speak of. No state. There's obviously yeah. no nations that hasn't been invented yet, the no. concept of a nation. And so, yeah, we have lots of different kinds of tribes that probably wouldn't even recognise each other properly. Yeah, yeah, probably they would have different um, different dialects, speaking mm. differently. They will be in communication with each other to exchange goods as well, um, like the Cornish tribes, they would have a lot of tin mm -hmm. would be able to sell. But yeah, the Iceni tribes in the east of, southeast of England, they will have more contact with Europe, with uh, mainland Europe and the Romans. So they would be a bit more um, in touch. They will have maybe some wine, some olives, some olive oil. So they will have a bit of that. Mm. But nothing like uh, we know. Yeah, the people would drink beer. Right. Eh? There was no wine. And there was some trade happening. So so like I know that um, the ancient Romans knew of this place called Britain um, before coming here as a place to get tin from, which is an in important component in the creation of bronze. And and then, as you just said, there were some, some tribes that had already started slowly to take on some um, Roman ways and like some Roman habits. Yeah, I, mean, I think the leaders of the tribes, yeah. they would try and copy the opulence of uh, of the Roman elite. Mm -hmm. and um, This is prior to the invasion. That's prior to the invasion, yes. And definitely there was a um, mixture of um, everybody communicating with each other. There, there was trade happening. And um, so, yeah, there was definitely contact. And I, lo I mean, I love the uh, image of the of the bubbling cauldron. Yeah, so I was doing some research and I came across a book by a woman called Heather Cool, which is all about the food of uh, ancient Rome in Britain. And she says that you know, we have this image of the of the cauldron, the bubbling cauldron, and she says it's more likely, given the amount that we found, uh, archaeologists have found of cauldrons, that that was like slightly more of a special and potentially like elite cooking utensil. Mm. And and she says that we don't actually know how Iron Age Britons were really eating on the day to day. It's still a bit of a mystery. Mm. But one thing that I thought was interesting in that book was there's no distinction between cookware and tableware. So like. 
ancient Britons, according to her, didn't really have like bowls, plates, knives, forks, those kinds of things. Like we, we yeah. must have been, or that those people must have been eating kind of directly out of the pot or whatever it was. Yeah. So the food shouldn't be too hot. Should be like a room temperature, so you can grab it with your hands mm. or with small morsels of uh, bread or we'll serve it on, be- on bread, like hard bread. So you use the bread as a as a plate. And so, so obviously, to ancient Romans, this must have been completely crude and barbaric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the food tastes better this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It tastes with know, your hands yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, in terms of uh, how the Romans ate, they ate lying on couches. Mm-hmm. So one hand on the head and the other getting the food. So again, the food was in small portions. There were no forks to speak as such. And you would eat your, with your hands as well. But with either small morsels of food or with uh, flatbread, again, you would scoop mm. the bite of meat or cheese or whatever you had with your uh, bread and eat it. So again, you, you, you used your hands mainly. So that was something that probably it's common throughout uh, the ancient world. And then we're going to do a tablespoon for this uh, garum. Three. Yeah. I'm going to do one more because we're not doing salt. I want to taste it. Okay. Oh, that, they're looking all right, huh? Yeah. That's how they are. What are you? They're looking good, huh? Yeah. And they're getting some color as well. Yeah. Um, So obviously before Caesar came and made a bit of an impression on the islands of Britain, and then before Claudius came and and invaded and occupied Britain, first contact, as it were, with these mythical islands came from Pythias. Is that right? I'm I'm getting this from your notes. Almost, almost. Pythias. Pythias, sorry. Pythias. So that you can tell how much I know about this. (laughs) Tell me about Pythias. Who is he and where did he come from? So he was a Greek um, navigator. Explorer, geographer, that kind of thing. Polymath as they used to be back then. From um, Massalia, which is modern day Marseille, the city of Marseille, one of the biggest um, ancient Greek colonies in the south of France. So yeah, he, I guess he was part of an expedition to find um, new routes to go to Britain for the tin, obviously for the trade, because uh, the Strait of Gibraltar was occupied by the Carthaginians and they kept a lot of exclusive trade for themselves. Mm-hmm. So I guess he went via Gaul, what is that modern day France, and then with a ship, with a boat, explored the whole of uh, Britain and Ireland. And um, he went even further north, apparently, to Norway. And from his descriptions, from what he survived from his work, because uh, his works hasn't survived the antiquity, unfortunately, from what uh, passages have survived from next explorers and uh, geographers, he might even went to Iceland. And yeah, he described, you know, the floating ice and uh, he calculated the, the coastal line of Britain. And so, yeah, we kind of um, think that he was the first that he brought back some more information about this mythical northern frozen misty land mm. into reality. Because before that, nobody knew <laughs> what was happening there. It was all the kind of fantasies of you know, blue people, giants, uh, <laughs> <laughs> feasting in uh, raw meat or whatever. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Which is, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not real. <laughs> so there was, a, there was a kind of mythical idea constructed of, of Britain in yeah. ancient Rome. Yeah, and I guess the, the, the name Britain, Britannia, Britanniki, was one theory that meant the people who painted the body blue. They were like the blue painted people, mm-hmm. the painted ones. Which they would do for war. Presumably. Allegedly, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a kind of really interesting thing happening where, so skipping back forward now to ancient Rome, the Romans want to construct the British at once as a kind of barbaric, backward, uncivilized place. But the other sense, they also see them almost like noble savages, but more like warlike savages who mm. are fierce yeah. and are worth conquering, are worth having a fight with, yeah. and are worth proving yourself that, you know, like if you've conquered this land, it wasn't just walking through and, you know, yes, yes, collecting, exactly. the, collecting and like, the resources. It was it was a fight, you know. <laughs> Bizarre notion, but yeah, yeah, exactly. I think you're right. <laughs> that's, that's how they thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> but have a little okay. first. Yeah, let's have a cucumber first. I'm going to have some uh, ancient Roman smashed cucumber. Yeah. I'll tell you if it's as good as the one I get at my at Silk Road 
in Camberwell. Mm, okay. Silk Road, okay. Am I? Delicious. And you grew these? Uh, not me, my friend from the allotments. Oh, yeah. Behind Your house is so nice. There's like allotments on the back there. Mm. Oh, it's really delicious. Yeah, you don't get too much of the fish sauce. No, it's just kind of like seasoning. Mm. Walnuts, big fan. You know what? I already know that the ancient Romans did some great stuff for us. <laughs> so tasting these things, I'm like, yeah, rather dried figs than dried, um, you know, peas or whatever it was. That yeah. Threw it to munching on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're munching on. Yeah, I mean, there was nothing much there, unfortunately, in Britain mm. before. I have the sense, but I have the sense that Iron Age Britain, because it was seen by Imperial Rome as so backwards and undeveloped and uncivilized, that we're also kind of left with this sense that Iron Age Britain is like just a mm. really impoverished and unknown place. But a bit like how people used to think of the medieval period as mm. the Dark Ages. Yeah. There, there must have been a lot more interesting things going on there. And obviously, you know, Dru like people often say that like um, Celtic culture is so oral. There's such an oral tradition. There, yeah. there, there remains like very few records of anything that we can look at to really understand mm. Iron Age Britain. But I bet it was amazing and interesting. Just we just so. don't know much about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet, I bet. I mean, they would have yeah songs and poems, and they would have things like that, and would, that's how they would transmit, I guess, the culture. So, mm. just because they haven't survived, it doesn't mean that um, it wasn't great, mm. <laughs> or it wasn't. I guess they they had like tradition. That's what I'm trying to say. Just because it was oral and not written, it doesn't mean it wasn't tradition, tradition. and culture, and you know, yeah. obviously uh, the language survives. So, yeah, you know, a lot of it. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Okay, so Claudius arrives. Well, in fact, he sends his general over to invade Britain, and I think he turns up a few weeks later with like some elephants. Yeah, right? um, <laughs> to cement the uh, to cement <laughs> the invasion. And the question is, what did the Romans bring in terms of food? So, like, where do we start with that? Like, what? Why did they? change or to what extent did they change the way that we yeah uh, well obviously having thousands and thousands of uh, army soldiers um, coming in and bringing their own food and their own ways and then staying for about 400 years it means that um, slowly you have merchants coming traders you would have uh, civil civil personnel you would have families you would have um, aristocracy and so retired generals and legionnaires would have some land with some their own um, house and everything else. So you would have, you'd you'd have a bit of room in Britain uh, for all these people. And yes, these people they would like to eat the stuff that they used to when they were back in uh, Italy in, in Rome mm -hmm. or wherever they are. They were from from the Roman Empire at that point. It could be North Africa, Spain, Greece, Egypt at that point. All these massive geographical area. So yeah, you would have fruits which didn't grow here like pear and peach and uh, figs and mulberries and sour cherries and plums and obviously pomegranates and dates, but these don't grow here. But things like plums and pears, they could grow here as well. One, one of them that I really like is leeks, you know? I know. And just onions, some, like just kind of banal for everyday things like that. Like, yeah. Yeah, that, that ancient, it kind of seems like timeless, like onions, surely the Druids surely, yes, were yes. munching on onions. But the, the wild equivalent of leeks and asparagus and cabbages, mm -hmm. so that kind of the wild um, plants, but nothing- Not, not cultivated. Not cultivated, yeah. So when they brought, they brought cabbage, they loved cabbage, so the Romans loved them, um, mm. cabbage in many different ways, and they ate it also for ailments, uh, like a cure for different things, and also- fresh as in salads and so on. So yeah, cabbage was very particular. And um, yeah, as you said, leeks, as you said, um, lettuce, cucumber, turnips, carrots, parsnips. In terms of the animals that I really like, uh, they bought pheasants, which feels like such a British thing, you know, like a kind of timeless <laughs> yeah. British thing. Pheasants and um, rabbits. Yeah. yeah. Rabbits as well, again, so much that you think it's, oh yeah part of the everyday wildlife and <laughs> fabric. Right, okay, so I think you can have some fava now. This is exciting. You know, if there's one thing I like doing more than talking about food, it's eating food. <sighs> <laughs> I'm hungry all the time. <laughs> but that's the thing, when you talk about food, you get hungrier. Yeah, it's true. I think. Preparing for the show, I was like reading a lot about, you know, well, yeah, reading a lot about the kind of food that we, they were eating, and um, I didn't have, I didn't really have access to some guinea fowl or some wild venison or 
<laughs> but I did have a bag of frozen peas in my fridge and I right. was uh, kind of reading about the father thing and thought, thanks. And uh, yeah, decided to knock myself up a kind of thing like this from frozen peas just out of glutton, out of reading, <laughs> reading about it. <laughs> So yeah, you would have uh, you would have all this uh, civil personnel uh, and the military personnel in Britain, and they would eat. Um, they would import all this stuff to eat, mm-hmm. and some of it you, became part of the native flora and fauna over the centuries. Uh, yeah, like bears and, and um, pheasants and pheasants and rabbits, leeks. Yeah, and so really, you had this occupying force, of which were many. Um, legionnaires, and they were eating their army rations, presumably. But then yeah. you also had people that settled and would set up villas and trading ports and yeah. you know, traders and a, a kind of middle class part of their empire. Middle class and upper class, yeah. yeah. A lot of them obviously will be from abroad, but a lot of the local uh, rulers and leaders, they would copy the Roman ways. So they would want to be part of that uh, society. Because there was an integration of the kind of of the Celtic elite into that Roman society. Well, well, I guess, some, yeah. The, to some extent. To some extent, it had to be, right? Because mm-hmm. um, otherwise... How do you rule? How do you rule, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, again, you'll have more wine coming in, perhaps olives and olive oil and all these uh, Roman ways of eating and feasting and mm. living, <laughs> in a sense. I think as well, apart from the um, ingredients that we've been talking about, the thing that really fascinates me about this conversation is also the habits and the culture mm. that Rome brought with them. Because obviously Rome as an empire, one of the things that's distinct about the way they eat is, is the fact that it's um, based on trade, it's based on exchange. So some of the things you just mentioned there, like pepper, you know, that wasn't being grown in Italy. That no. Was, that was coming over presumably from Persia or further east. Yeah. So f- from India via Persia. Yeah. 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 And so so that's kind of interesting, you know, that kind of embracing of, of a broader non-local source for your food. Mm. And they're being transported in these vessels. What did you say they were called? Those Amphora. 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 Yeah. The way I was thinking about those, they're kind of like the shipping containers yeah. of ancient Rome. You know, yeah, like, yeah. like the way that like, a lot of food is moved around now in big in these big boats, whatever. You know, like this is what was happening. So they were coming all the way up from the, from the southern Mediterranean, from North Africa, from as far east as we were just saying, mm. India. And then, um, well, they were moving around in these vessels and coming, you know, as far as Hadrian's Wall, where some Roman legionaries, you know, expected to be able to drink his wine and so on. Yeah, 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 exactly. Have uh, their wine and have their spices, like black pepper, coriander, dill, parsley, anise, cumin. Another aspect of the um, cultural side of this I find interesting, again, is um, is the opulence. So, like, Rome has a reputation, ancient Rome, in, our, in lots of people's minds, I don't know what to what extent this is true, but we have this idea that, you know, it was a very, op- like for the upper classes, for the elite, it was a really opulent way of relating to food. Mm-hmm. There was a really hedonistic, you know, the lying down and eating grapes thing. Yeah, yeah. And was that, did they bring some of that here? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, do, you, we don't know much, do we, about that? Um, I think to an extent they have, they had brought it. But I think even back in um, the Roman Empire, this opulence, this extravagant way of living, it was always criticized and it was always mocked. Mm. And that's what you get from um, from the poetry and the literature of the day, that they're making fun of this kind of um, too much excess. And then the philosophers and the moralists of the day, mm. they would always be like, this is not the true Roman way. That's, uh, we've been um, influenced by the barbarians. Mm-hmm. That's not how the Romans should live. Uh, true Romans should be having bread and the porridge and... Um, <laughs> being more uh, <laughs> more virtuously kind of yeah rustic and authentic exactly yeah so yeah that, so there's the feast of Trimachia, which is in petronius petronius yes satirical he, yeah and yeah in, in his like yeah and so this is i also know this from um, a fellini film which is worth looking up on on youtube the scene of this because it's really bizarre and so yeah this is the classic example but obviously it's supposed to be a satire Mm. But what he's talking about are all these kind of extreme things where there being this feast. People are eating like sausages made out, like made to look like raw guts, eggs made out of pastry with tiny songbirds inside that you'd crack open, they'd still be alive, and then you eat them. <laughs> uh, there's like a lot of references to like the nipples and uh, vulva of like cows. Which they, uh, ancient Romans seem to love eating sexual body parts, at least in this depiction. 
was I, I found weird. Um, and just loads of crazy stuff like this, like really, really overly opulent. But as you said, like it becomes a theme of um, decadence and decline mm. for lots of Roman Scot like interpreters at the time. And then also yeah. the way we look back at it and, and the way, way it was interpreted later yeah, by, yeah. by Victorians. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From uh, even in our own modern era, yeah, from Victorian time onwards, yeah, you have this judgy way of looking back at the past like that. That was. That was what brought the decline of the Roman Empire, all this extravagant, extravagance and uh, opulence and um, ways of uh, living, which are not uh, moral, basically, immoral ways of living. But um, I think to an extent, it's not true. I, I don't think that was um, um, something common, to be honest. Even um, even the, the, the richest the richest of the elites. Yeah, they would have a rich meal. They would have more meat, more different meats and wine imported from the corners of the empire. But yeah, I don't think uh, flamingos' tongues and uh, larks' brains was. Uh, the one I really like was dormice. <laughs> dormice. They love dormice. So dormice, they, apparently, yeah, with honey. <laughs> yeah, you 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 put them in a pot, fatten them up on chestnuts, and then when they got really fat, you'd put them on a spit and cover them in honey and poppy seeds. Yeah, <laughs> I, that know. was the delicacy. Yes, that was the delicacy. That was rare because it's, I think it's difficult to catch them. Mm. Yeah, so I, I guess yeah. Why, why, why doesn't Fergus Henderson bring back dormice? You know what I mean? Someone should. <laughs> Joan. <laughs> and then in terms of what people were eating in the countryside, it was, and the guy, the countryside is probably not the right word, what people were eating in rural areas, mm. peasants basically, that their diets presumably didn't change much in that course of time. If we're talking about um, Britain specifically? Yeah. Or, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I don't think it changed much, no. Uh, I think it would be still... Lots of um, animal, animals and animal protein and uh, pigs and mutton. And stews, basically. Stews, yeah, yeah. So it's really the main impacts during the Roman occupation of Britain, during ancient Roman Britain, was among the elite. Yeah. They, they were the ones who had in, uh, access to all this trade. Yeah, m yeah. Mostly. I think, and I think the, most Britons wouldn't care much about that stuff, really. And that kind of is obvious, uh, when they left Britain, how quickly the whole thing um, reverted back to more rural way of living, like the towns and the cities were abandoned mm -hmm. very quickly in, in, in real life terms, not like in a day or two, but people that didn't see a use to be in a city. That didn't, it was a point. We want to be in the land, work on the land, have animals, whatever you do. Yeah, you'll be more an agrarian society. I mean, if this, you know, effectively this huge trading network collapses that is the roman empire yeah then yeah you can't hang around in you know bath houses drinking wine can mm. you, you know yeah you know london was completely abandoned for 200 years um like it was it was much later in the ninth century that it started um, being populated again and people would go into these ruins and see all these amazing big uh, houses and palaces and see what the who was here <laughs> the the memory was lost mm in a sense. And um, yeah, it was abandoned completely. And you, you'd have like trees and everything grow through the ruins and for 300 years or so. And the earth in most places, it was a, a meter high black earth. Yeah. Fertile soil mm. <laughs> among the ruins because nobody, nobody was there. Right, 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 right. So people moved in and they started growing stuff in London. They, were, they had plots of lands because the soil was so fertile from all the uh, decaying matter from all these centuries that nobody was there. And yeah, the place was abandoned. Wow. <laughs> all, all the cities and the towns, yeah. I'd love to have seen that. <laughs> It'd be very peaceful. But yeah, in a sense, they were colonial power. Um, I think that's the main point, that the Romans were a colonial power and they brought their own culture because mm -hmm. they thought... British were barbarians, in a sense, you know, they can define it as a, they got control of one of the land and of the all the aspects of of of, of mm. all the the resources of the country for their own for their own good, and they didn't care about the culture what was there before, and um, yeah, so they brought their own foods and their own stuff, and then when they left, uh, these things went away with them. I'll be back. After this short break. So, Where's this song? Uh, uh, I'm not gonna lie, it looks disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so this is gonna be a dessert. 
Oh my god, yeah. cool. Eggs and uh, pears. The pears are cooked in a um, sweet wine and honey mixture. Wow. Yeah. So that's going to be part of the dessert. I wasn't, I didn't see that one coming. Like, <laughs> if you, I, I'll take a photo of this, right? Yeah. But um, it looks brown, like slop, huh? Yeah, because you have I don't want to like this, I don't want to dish your cooking. Because you have um, obviously oh, red wine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Red, red sweet wine, then mm-hmm. it's going to be, going to look weird. Amazing. But then, yeah, did most of put, our stuff. Did you put fish sauce in that? Yes. You did? Yes. There's fish sauce in the, in the dessert? Yeah. You freak. <laughs> <laughs> That's a romance, man. Not me. Okay, fine. Yum, yum, yum. You will like that. You will like that. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, you know that Roman Britain wasn't like a monolith and there was diversity and there was obviously huge stratification in terms of if you lived in the city or, the, or in the rural area and if you were part of the elite or you weren't. But let's just imagine for a moment that we were, I guess, part of the elite in, in Roman Britain and we you'd invited me up for dinner, as mm. you have. <laughs> Um, what are we sitting down to eat? What kind of foods are there? Well, you would have um, all sorts of um, delicacies, We're talking about um, dried figs and olives imported from uh, Mediterranean. You'll have nice red wines. You'll have um, spit roast meats and um, you'll have um, garum, which is the fish sauce. And it's, it's ubiquitous. It was kind of the thing that would have on the table the most expensive fish sauce and people would serve themselves like tiny uh, drops <laughs> to, to sit on their food. Garm, as we said, it was something that was um, produced in the Mediterranean with fish and salt, basically, and you let it do its thing in the sun, ferment in a way. And this, um, then you extract the liquid, and that was used as a seasoning in food. Mm-hmm. And that was something that was like every Roman elite would have some garum. And we find a lot of um, little clay pots with um, remains of garum probably still smells like it because it's really punchy. That stuff. Yeah, what do you think? So we have, we have here in front of us some uh, recreation of uh, we had, garum. Where has it gone? We just, we, we tried it. Oh yeah, there it is. Yeah, I've, I've come across this stuff before and it's punchy. It's, uh, it's, it stinks, to be frank. But it's delicious when you put it with stuff. Like you yeah. wouldn't, it's like, like Thai fish sauce. You yes. know, if you smell out of the bottle, it smells weird. But when you add it to something, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and you don't taste it in the food. It's part of the... Right. Apart from you, you had a spoonful just a second ago. And you look like you're almost <laughs> going to be sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, very salty. Let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> and wine was obviously a huge thing. So, like... The wines that they were getting would be variable in strength and often incredibly strong, so they were drank with water, is that right? And, and sometimes spiced as well? Spiced wine for sure, and sweet wine, sweetened wine with honey or... Yeah, mainly honey and spices, uh, that would be one of the things. But um, the Greeks used to eat to drink wine with water. Uh, the Romans didn't mix, uh, didn't mix it with water so much. The wine would be of a varying quality. You would have very vinegary tasting wine, which was part of them... Rations, again, for soldiers, for legionnaires. So they will, they will carry some of this very cheap, vinegary tasting wine with them to drink. The elites will drink something sweet, uh, which we can try. Oh, wow. I'll have some sweet wine. This is a sweet, from a, from made from a sweet grape variety. Yeah. Or you uh, just added some sugar, some red wine. No, no. Tell me the truth. <laughs> Cheers. No, it's super sweet. It's delicious. So one when one of the manuals from, from ancient Rome, the Agricultura, Cato and Columella in another one, they talk about how you leave the grapes into the vine mm. uh, until the very end of the season to dry naturally. And then you pick them up, you let them dry in baskets and so on, and they get concentrated. And then you make your wine with that. Right. And... You have sweet, sweeter wine in that respect. Yeah, the Romans, yeah, the, the taste palette it was, yeah, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, nothing like the modern Italian food mm. and modern Italian Yeah, there's taste. no there's no aubergine, there's no tomato, there's yeah. no basil. We were just talking earlier, yeah. like how they love coriander. How they love coriander. And if you if you know Italians, like, I, I mean, I don't know many. I know a few Italians and I don't know many that like coriander. And... Um, they would, they would um, like their food sweet. So all the sauces were very sweet with honey. 
Because they didn't have sugar or not no. much of it. No, they yeah. didn't have sugar. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't know about sugar. And so it was. They were swinging the things, yeah, with grapes and fruit and honey. Mainly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I when I learned that, I was like, did they have bee suits? They must have got stung all the time when they wanted to get because they had, they were consuming so much honey. <laughs> Think of the poor beekeepers without the, without the masks, like the slaves. They would have been slaves. <laughs> slaves, right? yes. Yeah. God, there's a lot going on behind the behind the surface, isn't there? You know. Mm, mm. So you have the Roman food, the Roman taste. You'd have very sweet, very sour. Mm-hmm. and spiced. They would love them. So you have the garum, which is the fishy, salty, umami kind of stuff. You would have sweet with honey and dates and uh, syrups from grapes and um, pomegranates and so on. You have the vinegar with honey and uh, with your spices. So black mm. pepper or long pepper was important and was used generously from by the elites, obviously, in every in every food. And you would have cheese as well. You did a lot of nice cheeses, um, and um, they would make a um, paste like a pesto with uh, celery leaves and garlic and coriander leaves and parsley leaves and, and um, vinegar and cheese. And um, that was very strong, very pungent. You would eat that as a starter with some bread. Um, I like the sound of that. Mm. I love when you mention the fact that ancient Roman food was heavily spiced with strong sweet and sour flavours. It makes me think that they must have thought that native British food was bland. <laughs> Which, you know, Which is, yeah. 2,000 years of people thinking that native British food is bland. <laughs> some things don't change. <laughs> yeah. Strabo, the geographer, says that the British... I'm talking about the native British, uh, it was, they have lots of milk, but they don't eat cheese. Mm. So that was another thing that kind of uh, made impression to them. I guess they meant mature cheese, like hard cheese, because there was cottage cheese, as we said earlier on. But yeah, so this kind of very big pans and flavors, there was there was nothing really, yeah. I mean, apart from probably mustard seeds. So mustard, I think, probably was growing wild, and you can use it as a spice. Mm. And bog myrtle was another... Yeah, spice, yeah. yeah, used here, but there was nothing else growing. So yeah, the food must have been bland, let's say. But but I mean, this, this brings us back to the kind of um, you know ancient Romans loving food, the cultural aspects of food, and loving you know enjoying food. Yeah, I guess you know ancient Britons. Well, we just don't know really. We but, don't know. But, yeah. but yeah, there, there wasn't a lot going on in terms. Of, you know, another thing that the ancient Romans brought was watercress, which seals again like a really long-standing British kind of thing to have with your. Roast beef and so yeah, on. But yeah, yeah. That strong flavor came. Didn't exist. Came, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Didn't exist. Yeah. Me too. Not to speak of roast beef and and mustard. Yeah. Mm, and they also brought snails. Oh yeah, snails, snails, edible snails. Yeah, that was another thing. That was like an aperitif thing. <laughs> yeah, where's the snails, man? <laughs> well, I'll tell you where they are in the garden. <laughs> They're eating my, my vegetables. <laughs> the real thing that sets this burger. I mean, what, what what was the description for this? They didn't give it a title. No, there was no... It's like... The recipes don't have like titles. No, no, like meatballs on that style of X or what or Z or Y. Right. Yeah. So the real thing that separates this from the burger as we know it, apart from the fact it's made with part pork and it's got garum and it's got pine nuts and it's got coriander, apart from those things, mm-hmm. <laughs> is that it's wrapped in core fat, right? Yeah, which is a lot more like, if you have you eaten fagots. Cypriot, sefta- se- oh yeah, fagots okay. as well, yeah, yeah, fagots, exactly. What but are you going to say? Seftalia, it's a Cypriot uh, meatball okay. wrapped in, wrapped in uh, core fat. It's a delicious thing, core fat. We've got the Roman burgers in front of us and, well... Tom, why don't you say where this recipe com- comes from? So this is uh, from the book of Apicius, or Apicius, uh, which um, was written between the 1st century and the 4th century AD. And it's like an instruction, a cooking manual, with um, like 400 recipes, I think, so something like that. And um, it has the name of the legendary gourmand called Apicius, Marcus Gavius Apicius. And there's lots of um, recipes about, yeah, you have fish, you have meat, you have uh, vegetables, sauces, and... Um, the recipes back then, it wasn't like, okay, you have 50 grams of this and you cook it for an hour and it wasn't, it was just... They were just vibing. Vibing, yeah. Yeah. X, Y, Z. Yeah. Get to work. Mass it, yeah. Yeah. The, the X, Y, Z here is minced meat, 
which was specified as could be beef, could be pork. And then... Wrapped. Wrapped in cold fat. Yeah. And it contains also coriander, uh, pine nuts, garum, obviously everything's got garum, including the desserts, and some pepper. No salt because the garum does the seasoning. And, well, the thing is, it looks quite a lot like a burger, right? Yeah, it looks like a burger. So this is why you wanted to cook it, because your claim is the ancient Romans gave Britain the burger. Yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> McDonald's, watch out. Yeah, right. Okay, let's do it. If you've ever had a faggot, a traditional British Welsh, I believe, recipe, this looks a bit like that, but flatter, because mm. the core fat gives it that appearance. So I do have, yeah. I, yeah, I like faggot. Yeah. Mm. With faggots with gravy. Mm -hmm. mm, it's good. Anything wrapped in loads of fat is hard not to like, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the pine nuts. This doesn't feel Italian. It doesn't feel British either. It's completely something else. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely some sort of flavor that... Yeah, you can't really describe it as Mediterranean or... Mm. Coriander for me gives Indian food, but mm. the pine nuts are like Mediterranean. And then the core fat is just really rich and... Yeah. Yeah. You have to, yeah, if you like fat, fat mm. flavors, yeah, yeah, then it's great. I think um we should start a pop up Tom mm -hmm. where we do ancient Roman burgers. <laughs> cool fat burgers. Mm. We need um listeners if you're listening, we need a name for that pop up. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I'm a fan. You know what it needs though? It needs um I'm gonna put some more garam on it. I was gonna say it needs um some mustard and some ketchup and a gherkin. Actually, we have the gherkins. <laughs> we have marinated cucumber. Okay, great. And oh yeah, it's got the kind of sauce with it as well. So we, so if we're living in our ancient Roman Britain in an upper class household, it would be the slaves making this for us, right? It would they uh, presumably the ancient Romans brought with them slaves? Yeah, yeah. You would have your slaves. It could be locals. Yeah, but. A rich family would bring their own uh, personnel as well. I think one thing that's really important to realize, realize about the ancient world that um, maybe it's quite obvious, but racism hasn't been invented yet. So when we talk about slaves, we're not talking about people that aren't white. It's, um, it's a distinction that's to do with just being free or not, which is it's like a legal distinction. In a sense, yeah, yeah. But it's more complicated than that as well. Slaves were necessary part of the pre-industrial world, of course, to for the economy. But I guess, yeah, it's difficult to say that they weren't property per se. Mm -hmm. Like, there wasn't so much... They, they weren't lower than uh, than animals, I suppose. You wouldn't, you wouldn't say that. No, and yeah. you, could, you could also buy your way out of slavery, or you could earn your way out of slavery. So um, that's what I mean by like a legal distinction. It was like a, a title that you were kind of held in. Yeah. I mean, also... So back to the kind of the racism thing, you get examples of North Africans soldiers in up at Hadrian's Wall, yeah. where you'll get them using Latin and their native tongue, which is just fascinating, you know. And one thing that uh, Romans were influenced by the northern, uh, by the northerners, by the Brits, it was um, so the, the Roman soldiers in um, Hadrian's Wall, they were also drinking beer. Mm. They were drinking a lot of beer. So part of the tablets that they found, one of the notes was like, bring us some beer. We don't have beer here. So it wasn't just the Romans influencing Britons with their own ways of food and wine. It was also working the other way around as well. Yeah, that's what I found really fascinating about that because I was trying to find examples of exchange going both ways, which must have happened. Mm. And beer seems to be the only example that we can find from those tablets, which were yeah. recovered in the, in the Northeast. But uh, apart from that, Britain was still really peripheral to the empire, right? There were... Yeah. It's not like there were any, like, senators from Britain in the Roman Senate or any kind of exchange on, like, that deeper political level. And, like, I don't think there's any... Beyond beer, I can't think of any examples in the admittedly quite small amount of research I did <laughs> <laughs> of, of the exchange going both ways. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, we don't have much uh, information about the other working the other way around but um yeah we know that beer was one of the important things that um went and south st and still is yeah at least to my heart 
you know? So eventually, obviously, the Romans leave Britain after almost 400 years. And not long after that, you know, Rome kind of enters a kind of terminal decline. The Romans pull out of Britain. What of their influence remains in terms of food? Culture-wise, very little. Probably nothing for the, for the initial couple of centuries, in many respects, really. Just a memory, just a faint memory. In terms of the ingredients, mm. a lot of them then become native, as we said earlier on, to the British Isles. Mm-hmm. So yeah, vegetables and fruits, they become cultivated by people, everyday people. And then, yeah, uh, animals as well, like perhaps rabbits and snails that become part of the fauna of, of the islands and uh, pheasants as well. So the, these ingredients form part of the ladder, of the local ladder. But in terms of um, culture, food culture, I think there's nothing uh, we can say it remains. Right, right, right. We can basically say that people are reverting more or less back to a more Celtic way of uh, of living. With some Saxon influence, some German. And then, yeah, you have uh, yeah, the Saxons and then <laughs> yeah, okay. other invading forces uh, yeah. from, from the north. But none of which really until, I guess, the Renaissance kind of pick up uh, ancient Roman ways again. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, we have the medieval period, which is obviously you still have different elements of, um, yeah, you have spices, you have wine, important from France this way, because France, most of France was part of England. Yeah, you bring wine, Bordeaux wine, and so on. But uh, in terms of in terms of the direct influence from ancient Rome to Britain, there's nothing until after the Renaissance, and especially going towards the Victorian era and afterwards. Yeah, and so spices pretty much leave this country until like the Crusades or something, so yeah. in the 11th century. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, back to bland, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, also they were carrying cheese with them as part of the ration. Mm-hmm. So you obviously to carry cheese on, a, on an expedition it must be cheese that lasts. So it has to be hard cheese. Yeah, when we talk about the lasting effects of Rome and Britain, I think another way to think about this could be in terms of Christianity. And I know it's disputed in terms of who brought Christianity and how Christianity was transferred to Britain. But it's surely the case that the networks between Britain and Rome, you know, the seat of um, Christianity, were made through this connection. And so, so obviously the Roman occupation played a big part in that. And so, like, Christianity has obviously completely, or did, you know, completely transform Britain's relationship with food, if you think, in terms of fasting and and the kind of diet that, yeah, uh, yeah, and the the feasting and and ritual and so on. So I think that could be seen as a lasting legacy, maybe, but I don't know if that's a bit of a stretch. Yes and no, yeah. I can see what you mean. I can see it as as a legacy of of Rome, in a way. Um, A new religion coming here and fostering a way of life which... It has uh, the feast days and the fast days. And you have the festivals like in Christmas and Easter that you will eat more meat. And then you have the periods of you will live from the land and very seasonal. And um, in that respect, yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. It's one of the legacies that lasted mm. all these um, centuries and thousands of years since uh, Roman occupation. Mm. I think maybe that's more of a modern thing, to be mm. honest. When, again, ancient Rome became fashionable and came back to the, um, to the forefront in Victorian Britain with all the um, discoveries made in the land of Britain of ancient Roman ruins and obviously all the upper classes, the aristocracy going for the tours of uh, Roman remains in Italy. So they brought back the fact that Rome was great. Imperial rule was good because they had an empire as well. Mm-hmm. You have the British Empire at that point expanding and expanding and covering all this land, all these different masses and nations of, and people. So I guess they want to bring um, an element of, um, we have a continuity from yeah. ancient Britain to today and we are the imperial Rome today and they were good. Mm-hmm. They brought civilization to these islands mm-hmm. <laughs> and we bring civilization to the world. Yeah. I think 
part of that link, perhaps they did actually try to justify many things, as you said, with uh, the role, the roles of the women and the mm-hmm. peasants and the different class systems. I think that was a lot of trying to to link it to that imperial. It's like a post-rationalization. Yeah, so the, yeah. this gender division of labor had already been taking place, yeah, and they were and, kind of rationalizing in term in Roman terms, ancient Roman yeah, terms. Yeah, yeah, and like it's normal and good, and yes, they were two thousand years ago, and we bring more civil civilization to to other people so we are kind of mm. taking the button and passing it mm. yeah i think it's definitely not it's not a coincidence that the victorians were kind of obsessed with ancient rome um and there's lots of examples of that in literature in like political speeches i think there's a there was a whole like fashion for victorians to, like pose in ancient roman dress and like take photos of themselves and i was just wondering on that like if it's not only using ancient Rome to justify the British Empire, which in the Victorian period was was at its peak, you know, reaching its peak. But also, I wonder if the way in which Roman decadence was understood to be a symptom of decline might also explain kind of some of the opposite tendency in our food culture, yes. which is to say that, like, you know, like like Victorians and, and certainly Britain in general is quite known for like culinary like austerity for being quite austere and dour and you know not mm. not into opulence and I wonder if part of that was fed by the fact that yeah Victorians looked at ancient Rome and saw these giant feasts and saw this decadence and saw it as a symptom of decline and something that they shouldn't repeat in yeah. order to hold their own empire together yes again that's another stretch <laughs> but i'm good at making these <laughs> kind of speculative claims i know what you mean i mean yeah, they do sound very speculative but i think there is always this element of uh, the moral the moral element of uh, the people who lived in the time mm. that they say okay we cannot possibly have this luxury that's that's a sin for x y reason so right. how do you transmit that to people saying okay if we if we become so decadent then mean we will collapse so as uh, the Roman Empire collapsed uh, all mm. these uh, years ago. So, yeah, there, I think there is an element of that. Because, like, the Tudors were into that decadence. stuff. Yeah. You know, they loved a, like, huge pheasant or peacock or something, you know, stuffed. and Feasts, yeah, yeah huge feasts. Yeah, all feasts. that kind of went away, you yeah. know, in the Elizabethan Victorian. You had, yeah, on that uh, yeah, on that note, also, obviously, the aristocratic people, the elites, they still had many, many huge feasts. They had their evening meals were stretching for hours, you had all these different courses. And I guess, yeah, that was in stark contrast to what uh, the poor people ate. So mm-hmm. you had really, really small elite who ate gloriously, mm. and you had the big population in the industrial era that... Oliver Twist style, yeah, holding a bowl out poor, for yeah. some porridge or something. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I think there was an element on that, okay, how we have to tip the balance a little bit because there is injustice and that will bring decline and this decline will bring the collapse of the empire. So we have to do something to to make it a bit more... Liberal and equal. Yeah, so I think there was always all this links and tenues mm. or not de- so tenues with the Roman Empire. I mean, the other comparison, if we're making it between Victorian Britain and Roman Britain, was these Britain became part of a, a global trading network. Mm. So pepper, again, becomes available. But, you know, the Victorians are quite happy to eat things like kedri, you know, like yeah. basically rice porridge with loads of curry powder or yeah. whatever it would be. Yeah. You know? yeah, they, <laughs> so, so there's, again, there's a kind of cosmopolitanism, an embracing of the foods of empire as part of your own. Like, so, you know, ancient Romans, as you say, loved pepper, but it wasn't because pepper came from Rome, but pepper was accessed through the empire and it, that therefore was yeah. Roman. You know? Yeah. And I guess the same thing with the Victorians' kind of confidence around eating spices. Like, it wasn't seen as something outside of Britain. Oh, it was yes. seen as something inclusive, part of the empire. But, yeah, it's part of uh, what we look at us. We have all the stuff. We are rich. Yeah, exactly. And also familiar, like, belongs to us. It's mm. entitled, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a com- confidence there. That was a, a super interesting conversation. And, um, you know, more importantly, the food was actually really delicious. So, Tom, thank you so much for that. Thanks for inviting me over. We have one more course. Uh, do we have? Oh, my God. Yeah, we have the fish sauce cake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Tom, when I arrived, showed me what can only be described as a kind of like whiny pear slushy slurry thing that I was dubious about before he said that it contains fish sauce as well 
And then I was even more dubious about it. Okay, you're selling it now. You're selling it very well. But after it's been in the oven, it's come out. It looks a bit. It just looks like a cake. It looks quite nice. There's no flour in it though. It's like a, no. more like a custard. Yeah. And there's obviously no sugar in it. There's honey. Yeah, and um, it's with pears. So it's called patina with pears. So it's like a egg set with fruits and sweet and with the, honey. And, and the wine will bring some sweetness to it yeah. as well. Yeah. So let's uh, try this, but. Before you try. Do you know if the did the ancient Romans have sweet ending the meal? Because that division always seems quite strange to me. That division between savory and sweet. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I mean, like like I said, a lot of the main courses they were full of honey mm -hmm. and sweet, sweet and sour. So there was not. Yeah, that's much more modern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would have your dried fruits with um, maybe with your wine course at the end. Mm -hmm. But yeah, not like in Chinese food. Yeah, you know, sugar and or in a lot of Asian food, like sugar just features throughout. Yeah, you don't just have the sweet yeah. thing in the end. Yeah, yeah. I think in that respect, yeah, ancient Roman and Greek cuisine was a lot more similar to the Far Eastern cuisines. Like, mm. to my mind, that makes sense. Like, it seems like the Chinese and the ancient Greek and Roman were more close than <laughs> yeah, yeah. Than today's cuisine. Wow. Yeah, tell that to a modern Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid of them. <laughs> right, so try it without uh, okay. the sauce. So we have the wine, honey wine sauce now. So let's try it without it. Because okay. well, that should be fruity. And it has also cumin, spiced with cumin. Ah, oh, wow. And it's black pepper. Oh, wow. We finish it with black pepper. An so. extra addition. Okay, this, this cake just gets weirder and weirder, man. Great yeah. put, grating some black pepper on the cake. <laughs> wow, it's so strange. The cumin is really strong. Mm. I like it. It's weird. It's nothing like you had ever before. No. So. It's like a kind of like spicy, sweet baked omelette. Hmm. I like it. I like that it's incredibly weird. That's that's the kind of experience I wanted to have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else was too nice. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, yeah. That's the thing. I mean, that's why I was interested in cooking ancient food. Because despite all the evidence we have, archaeological, scientific, analyzing all the remains and the modern chemical techniques that they, they can trace what is in the pots, right? And all the literally evidence from um, from the ancient world, you know, all, all these different, that the describe all the foods they ate, yes. But we don't know how it tastes. Right, really, right, right, right. It's like as close as you can get to really working out what it like feels like to be there. Because yeah. it's, it's really hard to like see anything that yes. would like with our eyes because if you go to a ruin it's a ruin it's not and it's also a tourist site so you don't see the thing we can't hear anything we can maybe reconstruct some of the music but you know this is actually like we're tasting the past which sounds a bit naff i'm gonna say but it's true <laughs> right <laughs> so let's drink some normal wine hail caesar <laughs> <laughs> good to see you <laughs> yeah thanks brilliant. for coming into the um, delicious legacy thank you so much for having me Great collaboration. It's a delicious collaboration. Delicious collaboration, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on this uh, adventure in uh, the land of ancient Britain. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and um, the food and discussion inspired you for some ancient uh, Roman British food. I've been Thomas Dinas with my guest, Louis Bassett, and thank you for today. This podcast can only be happening with your general support. So thank you so much for listening and for your reviews and for being such great people. See you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>